Okay, so um, we start by kind of introducing what I do. Um, I work for Stork England, and I look after one of my responsibilities is to look after the interests database system that we use. And um, I'll give a brief description of that, but that's not really what I what I'm here to talk about today. What I really want to talk about is um, is um, not only our experience, but also the um, some observations about um, digital recording systems within archaeology and and the challenges that that one faces when adopting them, and also um, the the results of those of that lack of adoption of many different systems. And um, so um, the um, yeah, and I mean one of the the key things I would want to point out too is that you can go and buy a digital recording system, or you can. I find an open source one, but really there's a, there's a far more difficult thing that has to occur, which is which is that process by which you actually put it into your practice, um, and it's not just you know when you're thinking at an organizational level, it's not just an individual project archaeologist practice, but in fact all of the project archaeologists for all of the projects, all the excavations they're running, and um, to be able to do that in such a way that um, you have a system that can be used by all of them to, to address their, their archaeological demands is, is, is a lot more than just a digital system. It's a lot of paper and procedures and processes and, um, and you have to kind of work with your colleagues to work that out. And um, I'm hoping that um, what we've done starts to kind of create a, a, um, something where people can at least start to look at that and start to consider how um, how they may go about adopting a digital recording and and start to see some greater adoption of it because I think that there's um, a lot of methodological developments that depend upon more people doing digital recording in the trenches and or from excavation data, um, not necessarily in the trenches. There's a variety of ways of doing that. and. Um, so I mean, you've got your. Um, so I want to define what I mean by a digital orphan. For me, a digital orphan is a system that's designed by somebody to do. It could be a variety of things, but in my context, I want to discuss you know ex capturing of excavation data. So you, someone is, and people have been doing this for longer than I've been alive. It would appear, and it's probably one of the earliest things people were doing with with computers when it comes to um, when it comes to their use within archaeology, and that is the structuring of excavation data. And so you, you build your system. It's a system that works for you. It's rather niche. And the likelihood that anyone else ever uses it is pretty low. And um, eventually, it falls out of use. And, um, and then a lot of knowledge is lost. And then somebody comes along later, and they build a new system. And they don't learn, as, as John pointed out earlier, some of the things around the matrix that are not being replicated in systems afterwards because well they couldn't get to that data or that you know that that work and make reuse of it so um, I think it's worth kind of discussing um, the experience we've had and hopefully um, start a conversation not just with people in this room but with um, field archaeologists with with project archae project managers with specialists with the entire spectrum of, of of people that we work with because it's through those conversations and experience of using digital systems and the surrounding structures to support them that we can start to um, to ensure that what we're doing really works for us and is um, and, and start to maybe see a bit more increase of adoption because you know I, I, I it's thought of and having I'm trying to figure out when I thought people would actually be doing the kind of digital recording that I still see very much in its infancy. And the, um, I mean, you know, I, I came over here in 2001 and I didn't think I'd be standing here in 20, 2016 still very much at the infancy, really, of, of digital field recording where you have disparate parties doing disparate things and still no kind of momentum about it. So that, that uh, it, it just surprises me that that we're still so so young in this process, and um, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I think I'm going to touch on some of those. So let me get going. Um, so um, we we adopted when we adopted Intrasys, and we decided that we wanted to um, acquire, start doing more digital, start doing this level of digital recording. Um, 
the, uh, the three aims we had were to improve our data quality, leave the field with a completed site archive, and um, be ready for assessment. So, so being able to, to take the data from the field and just really give it, hand it over to the specialists so they could start working with the finds, working with the sample material, and start doing, you know, start working with phasing and, and just getting on with creating assessment reports, and and which which up to that point had been a real hang up for us, where really struggling to get outside of that assessment phase and, you know, into actually producing completed site archive project <coughs> reports, and it was an, a real attempt to try and um, overcome those challenges and. Um, and I think these are these are largely challenges that we share with quite a few people. Um, and um, one of the things that um, that we identified, as far as the um, in improving data quality, was that the um, there's there's different types of data that you need in the field. There's the types of data that you need to interpret and to that you that you're capturing yourself in order to interpret the archaeology. There's the the information you need for assessment that other people need to do their assessment work. And um, and so so there's there's and there's more than that. But that's those are kind of the the, the key things. And one of the the area that we were really concerned with was that. We were capturing this data, and um, we had a real inconsistency to whether or not the quality, uh, how good the data was when, when someone got around to, to reusing it. And it was really at that point of reuse, i.e. an assessment, that anybody was, um, was really looking at the data in some cases to see was it correct or not. And um, so we had to... Um, we had to say, actually, you know what, we need to make sure we're not actually just arriving at this point where we're then, you know, storing up all these problems that we either know about or don't know about, and then it, it all causes delays, you know, it's just this, you know, a problem that could have really been easy to fix in the field when it comes, when you're out of the field and, and you know, two months later even, or and, and sometimes even longer, further removed from that field work, it, um, it becomes a much bigger problem and can be causing much greater delays. So we were keen that um, we were avoiding a lot of these data quality issues and that um, we could we could stop having so many of these delays. So um, so what it, what we had to do is we had to change. We had to um, and and. And change is something that um, I've spoken about before, and it's something that um, that is, is is immensely challenging. And uh, it, the um, and pretty much any time you try and introduce something new to people, they're going to bring resistance to it. And in fact, it turns out that not only are your users going to present resistance, but in fact, the implementers, the people bringing the system, are even going to be, be presenting their own issues and challenges around this change because it, we don't always fully appreciate what we're doing until we're in the mix of it. And and I think it's worth making that point. So. Um, the first thing we, well, a big part of what we did was we adopted Intrasys. And Intrasys is a um, digital recording system that was developed in Sweden and is now used um, throughout most of Scandinavia. It's um, pretty ubiquitous amongst field archaeology in Scandinavia. And in a, I wouldn't say it's as ubiquitous in other countries. It certainly isn't ubiquitous in the UK, as we are the only users of it. Um, but the, um, it's worth explaining why, when we adopted it, which was now back in 2008, we chose this system, because it hits to this idea of a digital orphan. We had a system that we were buying from a, from a software provider, well, from a, from a heritage body that had developed the software in Sweden, and um, this was the you know, sort of national heritage body in Sweden. And um, they, um, they looked after the software. They had customers. They had an income stream as a result of that. So there was a certain amount of certainty that came from that that, that we needed as an organization in order to um, justify the investment in that system and, um, and the certainty that comes from that. And also, we didn't want to get into the business of development. We wanted to get into the business of using the system. And um, we appreciated, and indeed, underappreciated perhaps that we were going to need to change the system for our use but um, we did not wish to get involved in um, 
the, the, you know, suddenly taking on responsibility for something. And maybe we wouldn't take on responsibility for it in, you know, two years' time, but we couldn't, we, you know, by 2016, eight years later, we could have ended up being entirely responsible for a piece of software that we were very reliant on, and we really wanted to avoid that. And the other thing was they had a help desk, so they had a system by which we could get support if something went wrong, if, if we couldn't work out what was happening, which, I mean, back in 2008, that wasn't as, as easily available as it is, and I know ARC wasn't available then, for example, and so that, you know, their model that they have wasn't something that we could look at. So, um, but critical to the adoption of Intrasys was um, uh, uh, what we conducted, which was a procedural review. So um, the reason we did this procedural review was not simply because we were adopting digital recording, but also because we um, realized that our procedures were out of date and that our procedures were not working for us. And uh, one example of that is that um, we, one of the delays we had going into assessment was that you had archaeologists, our project managers, who had been out in the field for, for six to eight weeks and accumulated vast amounts of um, time off in lieu due to the long days and the, um, you know, the in increased expectations that field work brings. And um, so they, they come back, they drop all, you know, all the tools, all, everything, all the data, everything comes back from the office, and they're gone. <laughs> And, um, you know, they might be gone for a week or they might be gone for two weeks. But meanwhile, people need to use all the information they've captured in the field. And it is, you know, it's, it's inevitably going to be somewhat flawed. And there's going to be questions that, that that person using that data is going to have. And without that person there, it was causing delays. So right away, one of the things we started to do was to say, right, we need the, we need the project managers back in the office for two whole weeks after that, after you know, exca excavations, a really simple thing to do, that that really helped to kind of resolve some of those delays. And it didn't put an infinite term on which they had to be back in the office, but at least said, right, we need you back during this period, and they could plan for that. Um, but we 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 really did a, a much much more thorough overhaul of how we operate as a team to try and identify all of the problems we were having, and. Um, in order to ensure that we could use Intrasys, we really had to um, develop the training material we needed because um, we needed to, you know, we needed to know that when it was being used in the field, it was being used appropriately. But also, we didn't want to have um, the term. The term that my my former colleague used was a digital ghetto, where you end up with with a um, you know, with individuals in the project team who take all responsibility for everything digital, and they're doing all the digital tasks, and they just become grunt workers for 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 IT really, and um, and everyone then becomes You know, they then become responsible for everything. But actually, it's you know, it's the project manager, it's the project archaeologist who is responsible for that data and responsible for making sure that that data is put into, you know, put through the processes and then comes out the other end with reports and archives. This is the responsibility of a project archaeologist. It's not the responsibility of anyone else in the team. It ultimately, you know, the, the, the buck stops with them. And um, in order to enable that, in order to have that empowerment, we, we needed to make sure that both our project archaeologists but also the, um, the staff we hired in, because we use commercial archaeologists to do the bulk of our excavations due to um, the resources we have it's just, and the frequency with which we excavate. It wouldn't, we, we don't justify. Um, we don't have enough excavations regularly enough to justify having a full team of, of, of field excavators. And, um, and so we needed to then provide the training for them. And, um, and so, so we developed all of this material, and um, the um, and a, you know, so so there was all of this. This ta this took a lot of work. <laughs> this was um, th this was a you know a big step. And I should go back to the procedures as well, because one of the things we adopted in in as part of Intrasys was uh, the identification of um, the need to do um, front loading. And front loading was um, is a term we've, we've picked up from um, the T4 work, so, so the um, British Airlines, uh, British Airport, Air, Air Aviation Authority um, Terminal 4 project at Heathrow, where um, they um, 
committed more resources to the excavation phase of a project in order to capture more of the information and then feed it back to the to the field archaeologists. So you're having a little bit of a you know a, a feedback loop about oh I've excavated this and then I can find out you know later on without a, such a long delay information about the samples that you've taken and the contents of them and the finds that and you know how they were classified. So you're getting things like spot dates, which to some extent I wouldn't say we we, we entirely um, have have delivered upon, but we um, it was it was our intention to to put more resource at that point. And one of the um, one of the critical things we wanted to do was to um, to make sure that the um, the record that was being created was um, checked. And so um, it might be worth me going back and just describing the workflow that we have because um, we don't have computers in the trenches be for a variety of reasons, um, many of which you already know and can imagine. I mean, this system relies on connectivity, which is is a challenge no matter where you're working, particularly, but particularly a problem in the UK. Um, I say no matter where you're working because that's, that's not entirely true. The Swedes have very high bandwidth um, mobile data speeds and they, they, they're quite happily using live digital data in the field but um, that's not where we're at and I don't know when we'll be there but um, it's all, it always feels like tomorrow um, and it has <laughs> for a long time felt like tomorrow um, but um, we take into the field what we, crack, what we refer to as pro forma and these are um, they look a lot like a, a recording sheet, um, but they're slightly grayed out to identify them as something slightly different. And the reason we've done that is because the way we see that pro forma is as an impermanent record. It is, uh, it's, a, it's, to, um, it's to help you um, understand what, uh, you know, remind you of what you need to capture so that when you create the digital, the digital record, it will be created in the computer, it, we don't see the, day, the the actual entry of the computer record into the system as a data entry process. We see that as the creation of the digital record, and and of the primary archive. Um, we don't excavate in London, as John pointed out. Um, we, we haven't done much. Ex we certainly haven't done any excavation with Intrasys, and we'd have to cross the bridge of of the need for the. Um, what, uh, yeah, I don't quite know how else to refer to it other than the genuine paper record, um, which we don't feel we create. We, we create the pro forma, but the, 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 the data archive that, and the archive that we create is a digital one. And it's created on site, in a porta cabin, on a computer. And, um, and that's that, you know, that, that brings in other procedural issues around how you resource and, and set up um, a, um, you know that that on-site network and making sure that that's working and, and so forth. So there were a lot of um, a lot of changes to how we did things that that we had to, to bring, and um, so the the you know now that we've been using it for quite some time and um, we've we've you know it's taken a lot of uh, it's taken quite a while and part of a variety of reasons it's taken a while. Um, that I won't go into today, but we have um, we have we have definitely seen some positive impacts from what we're doing. You know, we're leaving the field now with a completed and checked digital site archive, and um, and that has really really helped with being able to just bring the site, put it on the network, having the project archaeologist present, and sometimes where needed having. Um, the um, the excavators available as well. We're able to just immediately get into assessment and start doing that work so that those reports can be generated and the the kind of conclusions and and next stages of work can start to be triggered and and it's just really made our workflows a lot smoother. Um, and we've had fewer data issues. We're not storing up problems like we used to. We're able to just really address them and, and get to grips with them. And the, um, one of the examples that um, we did have and one of those sort of change issues we had was that we had a, um, is, is trying to convince people that they actually need to check the digital record and not the paper archive. Because of that being our primary archive, that's the one that we expected people to be checking. Um, but I really want to talk, and I've left five minutes for this, and I probably should have been a bit quicker about the first sections, but um, is, is that um, 
we, you know, I would like to see how we can help with this adoption. And um, I, I, feel like, I feel like this section could be taken in a sort of patronizing way, and I don't really mean it that way, because it's not about me helping anyone else. It is partially about that, but it's also about people like ARC, working with them, um, hearing from other people who are using digital archiving, sharing what procedures we've developed, um, sharing our training material, sharing the, um, you know, we have a system that if someone wanted to pick it up, they at least have a framework in which to say, you know, here's the straw men over here, let's have a go and see how they fit with how we do things. Everyone does things differently. But we have processes in place that people could start to use if they wanted to, or at least start to have conversations about how they could adopt without having to invest the amount of time and resource that we had to, because really the, the digital system is, and the hardware is, is, is the smallest part of the cost. The expensive stuff is, is your staff time and trying to work out how you're going to really adopt effectively. So, thank you.